All right, I think we can get started. Hello, everybody. How's lunch? Meh, yeah. <laughs> All right. It's a good time after lunch. We can relax a little bit um, and uh, let our food settle a little bit. Anyway, so this session is about, uh, well, the name is Java Life is Short. And uh, I got one comment like, hey, are you going to kill Java? No, this is uh, quite the opposite. This is uh, about, you know, using Java, but, uh, you know, it's about productivity and developer joy with, uh, with open source. So this is something that I'm pretty excited about. These two seem pretty excited about it. And, uh, well, hopefully you guys are too. Um, so just a disclaimer, uh, of course, it's a, an opinionated talk. There's many ways that you, that, I, uh, that you can go with a talk like that. There's many tools that you can use uh, to be more productive, uh, to have more fun coding and everything. So this is kind of my take on it with a few tools uh, that I can fit into this uh, session. And my firm belief that Quarkus is awesome. <laughs> uh, so I'm a little uh, biased towards Quarkus, so you'll see I'll be using uh, different projects, different tools, um, but you know I'll demo a lot of them using Quarkus. But you can use them uh, outside of Quarkus too. Um, so you know there there'll be tools that uh, you can use easily with Spring Boot or Micronaut or you know your favorite stack as well. But you know it'll be a lot easier for me to demo them with Quarkus because it has nice integrations. Um, so who am I? I'm uh, Kevin Dubois. I'm a developer advocate at Red Hat. Um, I've been in the software industry somewhere around 18 years. Um, and you know, my passion is really improving the developer experience with open source. And you know, open source is something that uh, we do, you know, I think quite well at Red Hat. That's all we do. So uh, it's a good uh, company to be at. You can find me um, on Twitter and all those different channels. So and I'll post the slides there too afterwards. And I'll I think I have a link at the end as well. Um, so, at the start, we have this, right? I mean, you start with Java and you want to create your hello world. And, um, but this is kind of a lot for, uh, for new developers to get started with. They have to know what is a public uh, class, why is it public, and wh why do we need to do that? What's a class? Um, what's a method? Why is it static? Why, what, what is this void return type? And then we need arguments that aren't even used in this string. So it's kind of a lot. And so, yes, um, Java's working on this as well. You know, this project Amber to, you know, simplify this a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, this is, uh, you know, kind of a complicated way. And, and I, I don't know, not so fun to get started with, especially if you have to write it yourself. Now, admittedly, uh, none of us do, right? No, nobody's writing this all by hand anymore. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you would have to do, you know, compile and then run it, and then finally you have your hello world. And you know, to me, that's not, you know, developer joy. That's a little bit painful. So the first project that I want to talk about is uh, JBang. So who's heard of uh, JBang here before? Okay. So JBang is uh, is a cool project to, you know, to get started with Java to run uh, in kind of uh, self encapsulated uh, applications. And so you can do something like jbang init and then uh, some random file name, and then it'll generate some code for you. Um, and then you can run it with uh, jbang main Java, and then it'll, well, return the same hello world. And, you know, let's, uh, let's see that. So if we do jbang init, um, you know, hello world dot Java, we can see, you know, it says file initialized, and we can look at that file, hello world. And yeah, that's pretty much the same thing we had before, except JBang created it for me. Nothing mind blowing here, of course, you know, because the hello world, okay, that's, that's kind of cool. But, um, but the nice thing is that we have the code generated, and we can get started with that, and then we can run it, you know, hello world. Um, uh, oh, bang, that's, I don't know what bang is. JBang, and then you know we have the same hello world. Um, as you can see here at the top of this file, it also adds a, uh, a, uh, a comment that your bash, if you're running in bash or another shell script, will interpret. So you can just run it as you know the file name, and that's kind of handy too. So what's cool about JBang too is that you know you can do a lot more than just create a hello world, of course. 
Um, so you, the nice thing is that, first of all, you can create simple JavaScripts in your CLI and get them running. You don't have to compile or anything. It d just does that on the fly. But you can create, you know, for example, uh, CLI scripts pretty easily too. So you do the same JBang in it, and it has these templates. And so you can say template CLI, and then if we do, you know, whatever file name, CLI.java, it's going to create uh, a CLI script that already has Pico CLI in it, and so you can get up and running with, uh, you know, creating CLI scripts pretty easily with, uh, with Java and JBang. And you can see, you know, it takes a parameter um, which defaults to world and then, uh, of course, uh, prints out hello plus whatever parameter you give it. So we can do another hello world. This is what you came here, right, for just seeing hello world examples in, in different ways. <laughs> so if we... Uh, if we you know, run it just to, you know, prove, so hello, and we can say DevOx UK, of course. And sure enough, it works. And so the nice thing is with Pico CLI, if I didn't know exactly how the script worked, uh, we can do a dash H, and so it generates uh, our nice helper script. So you can get up and running and creating CLI scripts with, uh, with Java pretty, pretty easily. Um, one more thing about JBang, um, and this is maybe a little bit gimmicky, but also uh, quite interesting. So there's a, a, a preview uh, where JBang interacts with uh, GPT. And so you can create uh, JavaScript kind of using GPT. So we can do JBang, uh, and we have to use the preview flag. And then in it, um, let's call our file gpt.java and say um, create a script that returns, I don't know, the square root of a given number, and I have no idea what it's going to return, right? It's going to go to the GPT API, and then uh, with JBang, it's going to create a file. And so we'll see. Hopefully, our internet will cooperate. If not, I have a couple uh, things recorded just in case. But yes, it did work. Um, so you need, uh, if you want to use this, just install JBang, um, and then you need to create an account with uh, OpenA OpenAI uh, for an API key. But that's all you need. You just set your API key in your uh, in your um, in your environment variables, and then uh, it'll it should work. So let's see what it created. I have no idea. So it seems like it takes the argument and seems to do a square root. So let's see. If it works, so GPT, Java, the square root of nine. I don't know. Oh, and it failed. Expected format is, yeah. But so, the, 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 the funny thing is, so I can uh, delete this file. Well, first of all, it's interesting because you can read uh, the file and kind of get an idea of what you might want to do. But so every time you run the, 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 the command to create this uh, script, it's going to generate something different because it's going to do it's going to do a round trip to GPT to try to uh, create something, and so GPT answers with whatever it feels like in the moment, <laughs> or that's what it seems like at least. So let's see uh, what it generated this time. Um, yeah, so something completely different, um, and so let's try it one more time, and then we'll move on. So uh, let's try that again. Oh, well, this time it actually worked, right? So it uh, did the square root of nine or you know whatever we want to do, six, six, six. Oh, wow, it's 25.8. Anyway, so you can create scripts pretty easily um, with, uh, with JBang, run Java, uh, Java files uh, pretty easily. And so I showed you how to use the template with the CLI and then uh, with GPT. You can also just tell it, print a cat, and it'll you know, print a little cute uh, little cat. Or you can say, create a currency converter. So it's kind of handy because it you know, gets you up and running with uh, some interesting uh, things. So that's uh, JBang. So I'm just going to go through a few different uh, tools that I find interesting, uh, show it a little bit, and then the idea is kind of that whatever you find interesting, that you, then you explore more afterwards. I'm not going to go like really deep into anything, um, but so you know some tools. So JBang is one. Um, another thing that I find kind of annoying 
with anything, Java included, is you have different versions, right? So maybe you're working on a project that's still running Java 8, and um, then you have a newer project running on Java 11, and then, wow, state-of-the-art Java 17, or maybe you're even uh, playing around with uh, Java 20 or the upcoming 21, but, you know, and maybe you have a vendor-supported version of Java 17 that you also need to uh, try out. And so now you need to juggle around with all these different versions based on the project, and uh, that's kind of annoying, right? So uh, for those who don't know uh, SDK Man yet, so, I mean, there's a few different ways of doing it. SDK Man is just a really handy uh, solution to this problem. So what you can do is you can do, you know, uh, again, get uh, the SDK man CLI. You can use SDK man, I think, to get SDK. No, that doesn't work. But you can use it to upgrade itself. Um, but you can use SDK list Java, and it'll list all the different uh, Java versions that uh, that are available in JBang. And then you can install, you know, this version of Java, that version of Java, um, or you know, anything. There's a, a bunch more uh, JVM related projects, like you can install Maven this way in different versions of Maven. So let's say you want to try Maven 4, you know, we want to try out with the alpha version a little bit. Um, you can do that with SDK Man uh, pretty easily. So just to show you real quick, so right now I'm running Java 17. And so let's say, um, and so let's say that I want to see what kind of versions are available. So SDK list Java. And then we can see, well, there's a whole bunch of different uh, providers that have a bunch of different versions of Java and GraalVM uh, that we can choose from. So let's make it a little bit simpler so I can do SDK install Java. And let's say I want to install Java 20. And then I can hit tab. And it shows me the versions that are available for uh, Java 20. And so I can say, hey, cool, there's uh, Java 20 uh, from the Adoptium program uh, with Temurin. And so I can do SDK install Java 20 Temurin. And then uh, again, let's see how nicely the internet cooperates. Uh, it, and so it'll install you know, Java 20 Temurin on my machine. Let's uh, skip it because it's a little bit slow. But I can, let's, let's pretend that I installed a few versions of Java, which is true. Um, then you can say for this project, SDK use uh, Java. Tab, tab. So in, in my case, I have uh, Java 11, Java 17, and Java 20 um, installed. And so I can switch between those different versions. So you saw that I was using Java 17 before. So if we switch to Java 20 open, and I do Java version now, now I'm running uh, Java 20. So you can switch around pretty easily. And you can do JBang install, um, you know, Oh, sorry, <laughs> JBang. SDK install JBang, for example, that project that I showed before. Um, and then you can decide which version or just uh, install the latest version. And uh, well, of course, it says it's already installed because I, <laughs> I just showed you how it works. And you can do that for you know Maven, uh, Quark, a CLI, and everything. Uh, so it's a pretty handy project. Um, so you know, so we're developing our code. Um, you know, we uh, we're creating our hello world, right? And uh, so, but the kind of annoying part is that when we're coding, we typically need to compile, then deploy, then run and test, and then we need to do the same. We need to compile, um, and so that's not so fun. But there's a few different projects out there that make this uh, a little more simple and easy to cut out, you know, the compile. Well, it does that, but kind of without you having to do it manually. And you can just write your code, run, and then test. And, you know, you have a much faster feedback loop. It's a lot more fun. And, um, you know, when things are more fun, we're more productive, right? Um, so, you know, Quarkus is one of those projects that does that really well. So Quarkus uh, has this uh, dev mode. You start it up. It runs your application. And as you make code changes, you know, they reload automatically. So just to show that real quick, so um, I can create even a Quarkus application real quick. Uh, so Quarkus create app um, devox. And so 
that this just creates a, a really simple project for me with uh, you know a, a little REST endpoint. And so if I wanted to then um, run it, um, actually let's open it in uh, VS Code just because it's a little easier to see. Okay, so you know we created a little Java application that has um, a main Java, and it created a little greeting resource for me. It's no more hello world, it's hello from REST Easy Reactive in this case. Um, and so if I go to my uh, terminal, if I go to my terminal, there we go, and uh, I do quark is dev, or you can do maven quark is dev or whatever. So it starts in this dev mode. And so once it does that, which takes just a moment as it compiles. Somehow my port 5005 is already in use. That's uh, interesting. Anyway, so it's up and running. And so if I, oops, if I go to uh, localhost 8080, then I can see that, you know, my Quarkus application is running and there was that hello endpoint, right? And so that was gonna sh show hello uh, rest easy reactive. So let's make sure that uh, that's going. If not, let's uh, try it again. Maybe there's something else running in the background that I'm not aware of. So let's try it one more time. Quark is dev. I love the, the live demo mode, right? It's like, this always works like super fast, except, you know, if you're doing a live demo, then all of a sudden you have like weirdness. So uh, it looks like it's, yeah, something is using my port 8080. So I don't know if it's a other Java thing or what. So let's do kill all Java. <laughs> let's see uh, if it was a Java thing. Yeah, so this is all going to die a little bit. Let's try it one more time. And, and, and. Come on, VS Code. Let's go a little faster here. There we go. Quarkus dev. Sounds like it's raining. All right, so I think it's gonna go. Yep, we don't have any port conflict, so there must have been something running. All right, so refresh again. We see our hello from Rest Easy Reactive, just like we saw in that uh, code sample, right? And so if I change it to hello world, because we're doing hello world everywhere today, um, I didn't need to save the file, and so I can test real quick uh, that my application is working. And the nice thing with uh, Quarkus too is that, you know, it has live test mode. So if I enable that, you can see, oh, well, it, my test failed. So because uh, Quarkus was nice enough to even provide me a test file, which of course is looking for the string hello from Rest Easy Reactive. And so this is a nice quick feedback loop to tell me, hey, there's some broken tests, so I don't need to wait for, um, I'm doing a bunch of code changes and everything, and I kind of forgot that I have unit tests. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's just me. Um, and so when you didn't, then do the compilation, the packaging, then all of a sudden you get all these test failures and you need to go back and fix them, or, you know, well, ideally I know you need to write the tests first and then do the code, but, um, but anyway, so this gives you a really quick feedback loop, uh, you know, to see, hey, there's uh, something broken as soon as you're changing your, uh, your code. So in this case, for example, hey, I'm uh, writing some more code and I want to add an exclamation point to this. And then sure enough, you know, it's immediately telling me your test has failed. So you need to fix, well, your test or your code. And so if we do that again, we can see that, you know, sure enough, uh, the, the test is passing now. So that's one of the cool things about Quarkus. Of course, there's a lot more, but you know, this live reload and that live dev mode is, uh, is really handy in my opinion. So we got the little guy that says, wait, so you save it and your code is running and it's Java. I know, right? Supersonic Java for the win. And so I actually have a couple stickers here if you like that. Um, so moving on to the next, uh, to the next part. So, um, which is test containers? Who, who knows about test containers? 
Okay, and who uses it? And who uses it with Spring Boot? And who uses it with Quark? Is sorry, <laughs> a lot of <laughs> good job, Eric. I like it. Um, so test containers is a is a, a cool project. Uh, basically, you can uh, start up containers for, let's say, I'm uh, creating an application and I have uh, dependency on a database or Kafka or you know some other messaging system or something uh, different, even a Kubernetes dependency. In test containers, you can configure it to start up an automatic container as you're running your tests, which is pretty handy. So you know when you run your tests, you don't have to have an actual database configured specifically for it. Um, but actually, test containers can be even more cool if you use it with, uh, with Quarkus. And the reason why is that because Quarkus has these dev services uh, that uses test containers even as you're developing. So as soon as you uh, create an application and you add a dependency and an extension for, for example, Postgres or for Kafka or something, um, Quarkus will look and see, hey, do you have um, you know, your database configured? Do you have that configuration? And is it running on your local machine? Um, if not, hey, no worries. I'll wire it all up for, for you. I, you don't need to configure test containers. You actually don't really even need to know anything about test containers. And it's just going to start up, for example, if I use a Postgres extension, it's going to start up a uh, Postgres database configured automatically to run with my application. And then I can use that configuration to you know, start up a container in my test environment or around production as a starting point. So um, I can show that real quick as well. So I'm going to exit out of this uh, little project. And I have one that's uh, Quarkus with DB. So code Quarkus with DB so we don't have to install too much. And so in this case, I have you know, the Postgres uh, JDBC uh, extension added to my uh, application. And because of that, if I start up again that uh, Quark is dev, and hopefully I, <laughs> hopefully I killed uh, the previous Quark is dev, I think I did. Uh, otherwise, we're going to get port uh, conflicts again, but looks like it's good. And so because I have um, the, uh, you know, that uh, Postgres JDBC dependency, uh, Quarkus, if you were quick enough to see it, is uh, starting up a Postgres uh, database container just automatically for us, um, and we can start using that. So uh, that's pretty handy. So in this case, I have you know a very simple application. Again, uh, I just have a fruit entity that returns you know some fruits with uh, some names in a season. And so if we go again to our port, our localhost 8080, and not the endpoint fruit. We can see, you know, like it just returns some fruits, but it actually returns that from a Postgres database that I didn't have running on my local machine. And so you can see here, this is a Podman desktop is an easy way to interact with containers, but you can see that in the running containers, uh, we have a Postgres uh, database running in a container on our local machine. So it just did that, you know, kind of automatically which I think is pretty cool and uh, you know, makes, definitely makes me more productive. So that's the, the dev services of, uh, of Quarkus using test containers. Um, so these were a couple of things that uh, help in your inner loop development. So inner loop development basically is where you're coding, you're doing your local testing, you're debugging, uh, maybe pushing to some uh, to, to a local branch or something, and then at some point you will uh, you know be happy with your code changes, and then uh, you'll make some pull requests or a merge request, and then at that point basically you enter this outer loop where you're doing you know your code reviews and you're building with your CI/CD, uh, doing security checks. Yes, you could actually do some of your security checks as you're writing your code. There's like a dependency analytics plugin that you can use in VS Code or IntelliJ. Um, but you know, let's say that the the, the enterprise, the, the the real security people are having are integrating tests in your CI/CD and everything. So that's you know that all happens in your outer loop. You might even deploy to uh, development Kubernetes or another server. And then, you know, at some point, of course, everything will be good, and then you deploy to production. So now we're going to look at some uh, 
interesting ways to shorten our developer cycle, have fun, um, but you know, in, in more in the outer loop, so we get feedback there too. And of course, then we're talking about you know containers, cloud, Kubernetes, serverless, and so now we need to be experts in in all this stuff too, right? And I don't know about you, but that doesn't bring me developer joy. You know, I like to focus on uh, actually developing my code. Um, so you know, there's all these different ways of building containers. There's you know, there's build packs. There's you know, the the, the classic way with Dockerfile. Uh, for those who were uh, in Josh Long's session yesterday, he said, friends don't let friends write Docker files, right? So um, there's Podman, there's Jib, and Jib is an interesting project. You can create uh, containers. It's uh, for Java, so it's a, a Java way of creating containers. You don't need to write uh, Docker files. But actually, you know, the way that I like to do it is, well, I, again, I'm biased towards Quarkus, but you can just do Quarkus image build on that same code that I just uh, created, and it'll create a container image for me because uh, Quarkus actually supplies me with um, some base images that, uh, that you can use automatically. So those are uh, base images. So there's one for running a regular uh, Java application on, the, on, a J, on, a, on a JVM in a container. There's even a Dockerfile native for natively compiled um, uh, applications or even a micro Dockerfile native. So I don't need to worry about these Docker files and they use base images that are, you know, that are, have been tested and verified and everything using uh, UBI images. So that makes it quite easy for me to actually create uh, Container, so I can just do Quarkus image build, and um, it'll build my application and uh, build a container image using those uh, those base images. So in this case, because I didn't supply dash dash native, it would you would have used the Docker file JVM, and we can see you know in in well seven seconds, which is actually quite slow, um, we created a new container image. Quarkus with DB uh, 1.0 snapshot because it just uses the version. Actually, I cheated a little bit because I already added in my application properties a few values um, to, to tell Quarkus when you create the image, make it with the name Quay.io, Kevin Dubois, and then with some name, and then I can just push it to my registry as well. So let's first run it on our local machine. So if I go back to Podman Desktop, I should see, yep, there's a new container image that was just created. And um, you know, I could run it. Um, and it's nice enough to automatically configure the ports and all that stuff. So I start it. And so now if we go to localhost 8080, uh, well, fruit is probably not going to work because I don't have that dev services uh, container running anymore because it tears it down when I stop my quark is dev mode. So it's nice enough to clean everything up. So we'll see that you know this returns an internal server error because that database isn't there. But our hello is still there. So it is actually running on my local machine in a container um, without me really knowing much about containers. I just needed to know Quarkus image build. And then if I wanted to use, let's say, uh, um, jib, then I can just say Quarkus image build jib, and then it will do the same container image build using jib. So you can you know switch between different technologies uh, pretty easily. So that's a pretty handy way to you know get started with containers. And then uh, what we can do too is Quarkus image push um, to actually push that image to my registry, and then we can you know deploy it. Uh, or, you know, maybe this is something that you might want to do more in a CI CD pipeline or something, but, you know, even if you have a local uh, or, you know, you have a dev, um, a dev environment for your, uh, for, for your team, then uh, you can do that pretty easily. So uh, that's pretty handy, I think, and, you know, helps me with uh, developer joy. So now we have our container um, or, you know, our application built. We need to think about how how is that going to work with deploying? You know, are we going to be Kubernetes experts and uh, you know write this all by hand? Um, well, I like to think that I know quite a few things about Kubernetes, but uh, I would not be able to write this by hand. But you know, at the base, this is what you need for classic Kubernetes deployment. You need you know a deployment, and you need a service, and then you need to you know write all this uh, YAML 
to say, you know, hey, this is the container image that I'm using, and uh, these are the ports I need to expose, and blah, 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 blah. Um, that's not fun. I don't like that. Um, so there's a couple different ways of creating these Kubernetes manifests or even deploying to Kubernetes in a more easy way. Um, so if we go back to our project, what, uh, what we could do, well, <laughs> the internet's nice and slow with uh, pushing that image, so we're just going to cancel it. Um, so we can add a Kubernetes extension to our project. So one of the ways that you can add extensions to uh, a Quarkus project is if you use a Quarkus plugin, you have that for, uh, for IntelliJ, you have that for uh, VS Code, and you can add extensions. And then we can say, um, I want to add a Kubernetes extension. And then, you know, if I wanted to use secrets or config maps or something, there's, you know, I can add the Kubernetes config to, but, you know, let's keep it simple. Let's just add the Kubernetes extension. And then uh, based on that, if I do my Maven package, we'll see that, um, I'm looking at the time, make sure we have enough time. In our uh, targets, oh, well, it's, it's running the tests and you can see here too, container, test container, Ryuk is starting, and then the Postgres uh, database is starting, so it's running for uh, running tests as well using the test containers. But anyway, so we created uh, our application, and you can see here there's a target Kubernetes uh, YAML. So it created that YAML that I was actually showing here um, for me automatically, and I could even you know use that to deploy my application to uh, to a Kubernetes. So I happen to have one here an OpenShift version. This is the OpenShift sandbox that you can uh, get for free just with uh, developers.redhat.com. But, you know, as you can see, there's no application running here. There's just this random trigger here. Um, and so if I wanted to deploy it, um, I could either uh, do kubectl apply that Kubernetes YAML, or I can, you know, again, use that handy little Quarkus CLI uh, to do Quarkus uh, deploy. And so because I already have logged into uh, the API of this Kubernetes cluster, um, it's going to just deploy my application to, uh, to Kubernetes. And then we'll see in a second that, yep, sure enough, there's my uh, Quarkus application, and it's up and running. Um, but again, we're going to have some issues because it was using that database, right? So I probably should add one. So I'll do that real quick. So add database. And it was a Postgres database. And we need to use the username Quarkus. And the database was Quarkus. That's what I had configured in my application properties. And so if we create that, we're going to create a Postgres database on this uh, Kubernetes cluster. And then um, you know we can make it more visual that this application is going to use this uh, database. And um, We'll see it at the database start up, starts up in just a second. Um, and so that makes you know working with Kubernetes a lot easier. So let's go look at it if it's uh, starting up. Everything is, of course, a little slow, but we'll, we'll revisit that in the interest of time. Um, so that's one easy way to deploy our application. There's, you know, of course, many different ways um, but at the end of the day, all I did was Quarkus extension add Kubernetes and then Quarkus deploy and it would deploy my application. So that's pretty handy. You can also use something like Knative um, to deploy applications pretty easily and scale up and down and all that stuff. Um, actually, the next session I think in this room is about uh, Knative. And so if you're interested in that project, uh, definitely stick around. Um, so moving on to the next kind of project uh, which is MicroProfile. And so MicroProfile is a spec, uh, it's a collaboration between Red Hat and Oracle and Microsoft and IBM and even some jugs are working together on this spec to make uh, working with uh, cloud native applications, microservices, but not only, um, a lot more easy. So it has these specs, for example, to do uh, how, how are we going to implement uh, open API or how are we going to implement using REST clients or uh, metrics, or what are we going to do um, if we're using a REST client and that client is not responding, we need some sort of fault tolerance. So MicroProfile 
tries to you know do an industry-wide kind of uh, uh, standardization of how to how to tackle those problems and then you have different uh, vendors who are implementing microprofile in different ways um, and so for example with uh, with Quarkus what what we're doing is uh, we're using small rye which is an implementation of uh, of microprofile and so what you can do is for example because my application was starting up in a <laughs> it's, it looks pretty slow, but actually, you know, you can see here my application, it says it's running, but it's not really because the database is not up and running. So it shouldn't be telling me that it's running. So what I would need in Kubernetes is, you know, liveness probes, readiness probes to tell me, uh, to expose to Kubernetes saying, yes, the application is running, but it's not ready to receive requests, right? And so what you would need to do is again, go to your Kubernetes YAML and add liveness probes and readiness probes and everything. Or you can just say, uh, add extension, um, health, and you can see here, small rye health. And if I add that, um, and we do a uh, Maven package again, what, uh, what Quarkus will do is it'll modify that Kubernetes YAML and it'll add liveness probes and readiness probes automatically to my uh, to my configuration. So that's pretty handy. Of course, you know you can modify it and and add to it if you want to, uh, but it's a pretty nice start uh, to get started with. Let's see if it's already added. It might oh it just popped up right there. So we can see liveness probes, readiness probes, and everything. So you know again that makes me happy because I don't need to deal with that stuff too much. Um, so let's say now we deployed our application to production and, uh, well, we're done, right? I mean, it's running on production, drops the mic. Uh, of course, that's not true. And it doesn't bring us developer joy because once the application is running on production, well, there could be bugs, there could be uh, performance issues, there could be random requests coming from, uh, from our business saying, hey, this user was having this problem and here's some transaction ID, so figure it out. And so, well, if you have to do that, uh, pouring through logs, that's not so easy, right? So, um, well, most of you are probably aware that you probably wanna add some sort of observability to your project. Um, so one of the projects that helps with that, so observability could be tracing, could be metrics. Uh, so in this case with open telemetry, you get, uh, you know, a, that's a standard, the spec to uh, provide uh, tracing and uh, visibility into your applications. So open telemetry uh, makes that life a lot easier. So here you can see this is uh, Jaeger where we're tracing through an application and I can show you that real quick. And I think I'm still, uh, in time. So I have another project here. So we'll just bounce a little bit between our different projects. Um, for some reason, this is still running. We'll kill that. Uh, so if we go to code, Quarkus, observability, this is an application where I added uh, two extensions. So I added an open telemetry extension and I added micrometer uh, for metrics. And so if you look at the POM here, you can see, you know, what we added was open telemetry instrumentation and then the Quarkus open telemetry, um, excuse me, uh, the Quarkus open telemetry extension and the micrometer. And by adding that uh, without doing anything else, uh, you get quite a bit of interesting stuff. So if we clear and we do our Quarkus dev mode again, um, we're going to run the application and then I have uh, an instance of Jaeger already running on my local machine. Um, I have, uh, I've pushed these little projects to my GitHub, by the way. And so in this one, I, I also added a little Docker compose file where you can also run that Jaeger, uh, instance that I'll show you, but you know, so just, so just know that's, uh, that's where it comes from. So in this case, we can see here, there's the Jaeger UI and this is really big. Wow. Um, so this is a little smaller. So if I go to my local host 8080 and I think there's also a fruit endpoint in this application. Yep. And there's just two fruits in this case, but it doesn't matter. So we have our banana and our orange. And so let's refresh this a couple times. And then if we go and uh, look at, why is it so big every time? 
oh, because I made the other one bigger. Um, so we can see, you know, this is uh, this application is called demo app. So uh, you can select that, and then uh, find traces, and then we can see that a few seconds ago, um, this request was made, and we can see that, you know, because we also added uh, JDBC tracing, um, we can see. Uh, what request was made, what's in that request, uh, how long did it take to make the database request, and we can even see, you know, in this case, uh, what the database statement was and everything. So we have a lot more visibility into what's going on in our production cluster or on our local machine. In this case, it's just running uh, locally with, uh, with, again, the dev services Postgres, but you get a lot more uh, insight into your application which I think you know is is nice for developer joy. Um, and then uh, what I also did was, like I said, I added the micrometer, um, which is on my next slide here. So micrometer is another project, uh, so also a CNCF project to add um, metrics to your applications. And so you can see, you know, like a bunch of different metrics. You know, what's your garbage collector doing? What's, uh, you know, how long is this taken? How many times was something called? And then you can add uh, different, uh, different metrics even to your application. So in this case, I have my fruit endpoint that I was already calling, and I added this uh, timed uh, annotation, which is, uh, you know, for, supplied by uh, Micrometer. And just by adding the annotation, I can add uh, timer functionality to this uh, method. So if we go and, you know, I think, are we still running on our dev mode? Yes. All right, so if we go to localhost 8080, let's do it here. And we do Q slash not dev. So that's the dev UI, which is really cool too, of course. Uh, metrics, wow, we get a lot of data, right? Um, now. I'm not necessarily going to pour through this um, on a daily basis, but these metrics can be used by uh, other components like a Prometheus or, you know, there's a bunch of vendors that you, uh, that you can use to, to ingest these metrics, and then you can have a lot more insight into how your application is behaving, how it's performing and everything. So we can go look and see where uh, our fruit resource is. Here we go. And we can see, you know, I guess I called it, I refreshed five times because, you know, it has uh, the count to five. And then it uh, even tells me, you know, like how long it took to call that particular message. But I can see things like, you know, how much CPU usage the application was having and uh, JVM memory used and blah, blah, blah. So you get all these kind of metrics uh, that you can use to optimize your application without, you know, like having to go into machines and figuring out how, how that all goes. And you can export, like I said, you can export this data to, uh, to something like a Prometheus or something. Um, so that was for applications that are running in the cloud. Um, I have one last uh, thing that I wanted to show you, which is uh, a project for when you're doing distributed applications. So if you're using Java to distribute applications, and actually Quarkus is a really good way of doing that because you, know, you can do your native compilation, you have, can have Java applications that start up super fast. And so where maybe in the past you would have used a different uh, technology stack to uh, create uh, CLI type kind of applications or you know other kind of distributed applications with Quarkus you can do that really fast with fast startup so there's a lot more use cases to use Java where maybe in the past you would have used you know like uh, maybe a bash script uh, maybe not but you know like Python or whatever um, and so a project that helps with that so once you've built it you need to release it right you need to distribute it. Uh, in different ways, you might want to uh, push it to the Maven uh, repository, maybe uh, push a release to GitHub. Um, maybe you want your application to be able to be used by Homebrew or something uh, for people to install. And so that's a little bit complicated to do all that. Um, then you want to advertise that you've released a new version, right? So you want to advertise to Twitter or to, uh, to Slack or something. Uh, and maybe, you know, like post it to SDK man too, so they can use your application with, uh, with a new version and everything. So JReleaser does all that kind of for you. So you just need to create a small, um, a small configuration um, in 
well, in a few different ways. So in this example, this is kind of small, I think, from the back. Uh, this is a, a YAML way of doing it. So you can define your project. You can say, you know, who are the authors of this project, when it was created, uh, how to build it. Uh, you know, like, do you want to build it as a tar, uh, gzip, as a zip file? Um, do you want to distribute it to Mac or Linux or Windows or all of the above? Um, it'll create the, the checksums for it. So the users who are using that application know that, hey, it's, it's actually verified by the uh, person who distributed it, who released it. So JReleaser can can do all that, you know, with a configuration like this in YAML. They can also, I think, Toml and uh, maybe JSON as well. But you can also use uh, Maven. So you can actually, by adding a few uh, components to your Maven, you can also create uh, a distribution. So that's what I'm going to do. So the first example is how you can use it with uh, YAML. So you just do JReleaser init, and it's going to create a starter YAML, and then you configure it. Then you do assemble to assemble it all, uh, your, your release artifact. And then full release will actually do that release, push it to you know GitHub as a release, or release it to whatever, and post everything. Or you can do it with, uh, like I said, with Maven. So you do uh, Maven profile uh, dist, uh, if you've configured it that way, of course, and then do a full release. So let's let's try that. So I'm going to exit out of this particular component and uh, do one more Quarkus J releaser in this case. And uh, here we have our Maven. So I have a, a little project, and we were running on Alpha. Two, and so now I'm making code changes, changed it to alpha three, and uh, I'll do a git commit upgrade to alpha alpha three, git push, git push origin main. And so now I've basically created, you know, a version that I'm ready to release. And so I have you know, configured the developers, licenses, and then I have two uh, profiles added to my uh, to my Maven to uh, do the assembly, and then um, and then the configuration for uh, JReleaser to say, um, well, I want to add the J the change log to see who uh, updated, uh, who who committed to this project, who made the changes, and everything. Um, how do we want to distribute it? How do we want to release it um, as you know as a binary uh, for Linux, for Windows, and and whatever more? So um, we do need, we need to do Maven uh, and then profile distribution and then package, and that's gonna package it all up. And then um, well, maybe not. Let's see what it said. Be, 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 be. Error adding file. Fail to create assembly. Okay. I probably needed to assemble it first. Um, but so we, we would do that and then um, and then we would release it with uh, the other version. So let's do it with uh, version two, the distribution package. And we can see it's packaging up our previous version. Uh, for some reason, I'm missing something in uh, in my versioning. And then I could uh, do a full release um, with Maven Quarkus, not that one. Maven, oops. If I knew how to type, it would be better. So it's uh, p release. There we go. And then we're going to do a full release uh, to uh, GitHub this way, which will probably fail because I already have alpha 2 version. So let's pretend that that worked. And then <laughs> if we go to, uh, to github.com slash kdubois, and then we have a repository there somewhere, Quark is JReleaser. And then um, we would see that you know our new release was made here, release alpha 2. And then we can see the contributors. We'd like to thank all the people that uh, contributed to this, pro to, to this uh, application, Kevin Dubois. <laughs> um, but you can see you know, in the assets, you see the checksums. Yeah, sorry, maybe a little hard to see. And uh, the, uh, the artifact that, uh, that we released. So that's uh, JReleaser, which is pretty powerful if you're uh, distributing applications.
So just to finish it all up, so we looked at a whole bunch of different projects. I hope this was interesting to you. Of course, there's a lot more to explore. But we looked at SDK Man, we looked at Quarkus, OpenTelemetry, a little bit of Podman Desktop in there, JBang, MicroProfile, JReleaser, Micrometer, and Jib. And so hopefully this gives you an idea of some ways that you can uh, you know, be more productive, but most importantly, have more fun uh, developing. So. Um, just a couple more housekeeping things. So uh, that uh, OpenShift that I was using, that Kubernetes, um, you can use that for free. Um, if you scan that code or you just go to developers.redhat.com, you just create a free account and then uh, you can get started with that, which is pretty easy. Um, we'll show that at the uh, Red Hat booth as well, I think. Um, and then um, there's a book that my colleague, uh, my colleagues Marcus and Natalia wrote about modernizing enterprise Java applications from um, you know, more classic uh, applications to Quarkus or uh, a little bit of Spring Boot in there too. But so that's a cool book and it's uh, available for free if you download it uh, through that link. And, um, and these are the slides. So if you wanted uh, the slides, they're available here and I'll post it on my uh, Twitter too. So up to you where to get it. And uh, that's it, I think. So uh, I thank you. And um, well, hopefully this was interesting to you and uh, you're kind with your ratings. <laughs> All right, thank you.